Sometimes the Bible gets ridiculously weird. From a talking donkey to a man being eaten by a giant fish. From burning bushes to hard-hitting teen Molly she-bears, there are a handful of cringe-worthy stories in the Bible that defy our sense of what's right and reasonable and acceptable and believable. But throughout history, some of the best stories humans have ever told are those that were never meant to be taken factually or literally. Instead, their very strangeness and absurdity create the context for us to reimagine how God so often works in unpredictable, inexplicable, and sometimes laughable ways in our lives. What's the divine word behind all of the biblical weirdness? Join us for this five-part series as we explore some of the surprising ways the Bible gets really weird. And why, after all these years, it still matters.
Good morning, St. Andrew. It is wonderful to see each and every one of you here this morning, whether you are joining us for in-person worship or those of you join us from parts across the country online. Welcome to worship and welcome to St. Andrew on the second Sunday of Easter. It is a joy to be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made, and today we rejoice and are glad in it together. Welcome. As we gather in this space today, I remind all of us that St. Andrew is an open and affirming and inclusive congregation. That means that whoever you are, whatever you believe, whether you believe anything at all, you are welcomed and affirmed here. At St. Andrew, we welcome people from all walks of life and families of all shapes and sizes and people from every point along the spiritual journey. So we are glad you are here. And if you are here for the very first time, we hope that you feel especially welcomed and a, a warm welcome this morning as we worship together. Let's take a moment now to hear from Carly about what's happening in the life of St. Andrew this week. Good morning, St. Andrew. Please remember, remember to put your cell phone on silent and to sign in to let us know that you are worshiping with us this morning. Have you seen the many ways to be involved at St. Andrew, even from afar this spring? Be sure to visit our website and to subscribe to our newsletters to learn how you can spring to life at St. Andrew. Did you know the funds raised at our annual youth auction help support our youth mission trips, our youth choir, and the youth musical. Our online auction is currently open now through the 21st, and our live in-person auction will be next Sunday, April 23rd at 3 p.m. Visit the website slash youth auction to learn more about how you can support our amazing youth program. Are you ready to take the next steps to membership at St. Andrew, or are you wanting to know more about this vibrant community? Next Sunday, join us for our Exploring St. Andrew class at 1145 in the library with a light lunch. To learn more about Exploring St. Andrew, you can always visit our website slash explore. Do you enjoy handbells and other concerts? You are invited to join us to hear our handbell choirs next Monday, the 24th, here in the sanctuary for their concert at 730. Please note this is not tomorrow, but the next week, the 24th. To learn about the concerts that we are having here at St. Andrew through the month of April, be sure to visit our website and the music page. Are you ready for a big serve, St. Andrew? This is our day of outreach where we show it's all about loving others by gathering for a day of service. To see all of our community partners and to register to serve on May 6th, visit our website slash big serve. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us this morning. For those of you worshiping with us remotely, please take this time to sign in if you haven't already and to connect to each other using that chat feature. For those of you in our sanctuary, please check that your cell phones are on silent and then stand as you are able to greet those around you with a warm smile or a handshake and wave as you feel comfortable. Now I'd like to invite you to remain standing as you are able and turn towards our center aisle as we welcome in the light of Christ.
you join me in our call to worship, the words of which you'll find on the screen. Holy God, we gather as your people, searching for the sacred, longing to be known, yearning for connection. In 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul reminds us to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So let us enter into a moment of prayer together, giving thanks for all that God has graciously provided. Wonderful God, we thank you for the mystery of creation, for the beauty that the eye can see, for the joy that the ear may hear, for the unknown that we cannot behold, filling the universe with wonder, for the expanse of space that draws us beyond the definitions of ourselves. We thank you for setting us in communities for families who nurture our becoming, for friends who love us by choice, for companions at work who share our burdens and daily tasks. We thank you for strangers who welcome us into their midst, for people from other lands who call us to grow in understanding, for children who lighten our moments with the light. We thank you for this day, for life, and one more day to love, for new opportunities and one more day to work for justice and peace, for neighbors and one more person to love and by whom to be loved, for your grace and one more experience of your presence, for your promise to be with us, to be our God now and always. 
Blessed are you, O God, who through Jesus Christ and in the community of the Holy Spirit gives us an inheritance that is imperishable and unfading now and forever. And now, loved ones, let us lift our voices up together as one, praying the words that our Savior Jesus Christ taught us to pray as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day the daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power in the glory forever. Amen. Friends, today, the spotlight is on St. Andrew's amazing volunteers who made last week's Easter celebration so very special. More than 2,600 people worshiped with us in person, with more than 3,300 folks joining us across all of our online platforms. With the help of volunteers, from setting up to cleaning up, and all the ways you served and welcomed in between, it was indeed an extraordinary experience of God's love and grace in community. So please hear our appreciation for our St. Andrew volunteer community and enjoy these highlights from Easter and Holy Week. Hi, I'm Lexi. I'm Margo. And I'm Samantha. And we're, we're here. <laughs> Easter at St. Andrew was an extraordinary, uplifting experience. Hundreds of hours of preparations by hundreds of volunteers made this joyful Easter experience possible, and we thank you. From singers and musicians practicing since January, to volunteers helping to decorate our worship space and feed our 174 musicians, to childcare, kids and youth volunteers, to a large hospitality team that included greeters, ushers, and folks available to answer questions and provide guidance with a smile. It was an outstanding team effort. The youth led a meaningful sunrise service complete with inspirational music and messages as the sun came up. They gifted us by sharing their faith and lovely music. Their beautiful collaboration made the service exceptional for all. We are grateful for the volunteers who made Easter Sunday so special. St. Andrew, not only did we celebrate Easter well, but as a community, we took the time to learn and grow through Lent and to lean into the suffering, uncertainty, and darkness of the first Easter. We experienced a contemplative Stations of the Cross art installation, a moving Holy Thursday service in remembrance of the Last Supper Jesus shared with his friends, a powerful Good Friday service where we evoked Jesus' unjust suffering and death on the cross and a prayerful indoor labyrinth experience on Holy Saturday. We are thankful for the way St. Andrew volunteers and community made an intentional journey through Holy Week. As an Easter people, our work of loving our neighbors, welcoming the stranger, eradicating social isolation and injustice, and living God's grace in tangible ways is a daily way of life. The work has only just begun and we're grateful to be doing it in community with you, St. Andrew. Thank you, St. Andrew. Thank you. You're clapping for yourselves. That's what you're doing. Thank you, St. Andrew, for being such a welcoming and loving community of faith. You really shined on Easter, and believe it when I tell you that we are inspired by all of you. Friends, as you give your offering this morning, we invite you to utilize one of the online giving platforms or the offering place that will be passed among you shortly. If you've already given online, we encourage you to get that little card from the back of your Cedar pew and simply drop that in the plate as it goes by as a symbol of your online gift. As always, we hope you will join us in this way to support all of the wonderful ministries here at St. Andrew. Let us pray. Loving God, receive our offering and use it and us for the highest good.
For as our reading today comes to us from the book of Lamentations, the book of Lamentations. Most scholars assume that Lamentations was composed shortly after the fall of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians in 586 BCE, when the grief was still fresh. The book itself is a collection of highly stylized poems that stand in a long tradition of laments for fallen cities dating all the way back to the end of the third millennium during the age of the Sumerians. Now, despite scholarly debate, the tradition that Jeremiah was the author of Lamentations is ancient and persistent. Reading Lamentations reveals deep grief, sorrow, and even complaint over past events. Yet as we shall hear today, embedded within the poetry of Lamentations, is a call to a radiant hope for the future and steadfast assurance in God's mercy and compassion. Here now a reading from Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 through 23 from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. May God add a blessing to the reading of this word. Friends, we have a special gift today here at St. Andrew. Those of you who have been around St. Andrew long enough know my passion for reimagining our concepts of God and reintroducing ourselves to the loving God of the Bible that so many people today have never met. Today we welcome uh, the Reverend Dr. Thomas J. Ord, one of the most influential uh, theologians of our time in speaking about the God of love that we find in the Bible. Uh, Tom is, um, is the director of a doctoral program uh, at uh, 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 Northwind Theological Seminary. He's also the director of the Center for Open and Relational Theology. He's an ordained minister in the Church of the Nazarene, which is a branch of the Wesleyan tree that we share in common. He's uh, married with three adult daughters he lives currently in uh, Idaho, just outside of uh, Boise, and he's just a gift to this ongoing, emerging conversation about the God of the Bible many of us have never met. He's a speaker and a theologian about the God of love. And we are so grateful to have Tom. Would you please welcome him to our congregation? Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much, Pastor Mark, for that introduction. When people say that I'm a theologian, I have a lot of things kind of go through my head. One of them is that, you know, everybody in one sense is a theologian. If you're thinking about God and the divine, ultimate reality, well, welcome. You're also a theologian. But uh, I get that label because I do it for a living. <laughs> I think about God for a living, help other people think about God for a living. It makes it awkward sometimes, however, when I'm at a party and someone says, what do you do? <laughs> and I say, I'm a theologian. And usually that, you know, cuts the conversation off, just like that. <laughs> Once I had someone say, now is that a heavy metal band? <laughs> I said, hey, you're my kind of person. <laughs> but sometimes, and it seems to happen most often in coffee shops, 
when people find out I'm a theologian, there are some people who seem to believe it's their opportunity to set me straight about God. Like, I've got the truth and I need to tell you about what God is really like. And uh, I want to talk about God this morning, but I want to say up front, I'm not pretending I've got God figured out. I don't know these things with certainty. I, I do think these are really helpful and maybe they'll be helpful to you. One of those people who uh, acted that way is Ahmed. And uh, he was intent on telling me about God as he was certain God was. He said, God is timeless, omnipotent, immutable, indestructible, impenetrable, impassable. And I'm thinking, man, this is amazing. These guys know big words here. And I'm also thinking to myself, you know, you're not the first one in history to think God is like this. But after he talked about this timeless, independent God who needs no one and nothing, I said, you know, when I think about God, I try to start with love and then kind of go from there on what I, else I think God is like. I said, how does love fit in your scheme when you think about God? He said, well, I think God is loving. But God's love is totally different from your love and mine. God's love is in a category all itself. It's an absolute mystery. And you and I can't understand it at all. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, so you're certain that God is timeless, impenetrable, omnipotent, yada, yada. But when it comes to love, it's like, who knows? There's a whole other category. Maybe something should be different. It reminds me of another conversation with Margie. Oh, I forgot to put the uh, subtext there. God has no needs, according to Ahmad, and exists outside of time. Let me go to Margie, though. Margie found out I was a theologian and decided this was her opportunity to complain about everything wrong in the world. And she had America especially in mind. And she started going on and on about how God is angry pissed off at what people are doing, and God is punishing us for our sin. In fact, she said, the pandemic is evidence number one that God is mad at America. And I thought to myself, you know, we're not the only ones facing the pandemic, but anyway, that's, that's on the side. And I said to her, well, what about God being a forgiving God? She said, God forgives the righteous but punishes the unrighteous. And I said, well, think about that a second. If people are righteous, they really don't have anything to be forgiven for. So you're saying God doesn't really ever forgive? She said, we're all unrighteous. I said, okay, so God doesn't forgive anybody? And I could tell her she's kind of scrambling in her brain, trying to keep up with my thinking and, you know, trying to, I don't know, debate in the wrong word, but trying to inter interact with me in some way. And then, as if she didn't even hear my question, she said, God hates the gays. And I'm like, okay, so you're a person who's really not going to engage in a conversation with me here and not going to be able to work through some of these things. Maybe we ought to change the subject. Not everybody, however, is like these two individuals who think that God has no needs outside of time and God loves the faithful but punishes the unfaithful. Some people have views about God that I don't particularly like, but they, they feel uncomfortable with those views. Take Karen, for instance. Karen was in a really vulnerable conversation with me about God. She is a person who cares a lot about folks who've been abused, especially sexually abused. She herself told me she was one of those, and she knew many other people. And she was trying to wrestle with how a God of love could allow that. Now, she was clear to say she didn't think God caused abuse, but, because she thought God was all-powerful, omnipotent, in charge, in control, she thought God allowed it, permitted it. She thought abuse was a part of some 
mysterious divine blueprint, a master plan, and that we couldn't understand it, but in some way, this plan, which included abuse, was a good plan. I posed a question to her that she'd never heard before. I asked, what if there is a loving God who simply can't prevent abuse single-handedly? Can't. Now, sometimes when I use that word can't in reference to God, people are like, yeah, get thee behind me, Satan. Like, God can't do something? But in this case, I could see a light come on in Karen's eyes. What? There's a loving God who didn't allow what happened to me? As if God could have stopped it, but but decided to permit it instead? I've come to believe that there are two big ideas about God circulating in society. Now I know there's lots of nuance, and we could go into the details, and I get paid to do that, but today I don't want to go into too many details. I want to talk about two big visions of God. One vision, the God that I've been describing, that Karen, Margie, and Ahmed all believe in. And another view that I want to propose to you today and that you've heard some from Pastor Mark as well. These two visions of God I want to call, if I can get to my my right slide here, a conventional or maybe a traditional view of God and an open or open and relational view of God. And to do this, to kind of set it up so that you have some clearer ideas of what I mean by both of these alternatives, I want to look at ten characteristics of each one, all right, and talk some about it. Some of these things you probably have heard before, others might be new to you, but it might be nice to kind of compare and contrast today as I talk about these particular ways of thinking about who God is and how God acts. Now, remember, I'm not claiming this morning that I've got God figured out. I'm not walking around saying, I've got the right way, and if you disagree with me, you must be a moron or something. I'm coming to you today proposing a vision of God that I find preferable, and maybe you will too, who knows. But I want to be clear by contrasting this vision with what I'm calling the conventional God. First of all, most people don't really ever think about God's relation to time, but that's actually a really interesting question. The question is usually posed, is God outside of time, seeing all of history in one glance? That's actually the view of a lot of Christian, Muslim, and Jewish uh, theologians throughout history, that somehow, as Augustine put it, God created time and now sits outside it and sees the beginning and the end all at one glance. Is that the best way to look at God? That's what the conventional view says. Another view says, or another aspect of this view says that God is omnipotent, in control. And some people actually find a certain amount of comfort believing that God is in control. When something bad happens, they say, ah, well, I don't understand, but God's in control. I got to admit, I don't find that comforting, but I know some people do. And it rubs me wrong when I think about another conviction I have, which is, freedom, agency. If God is controlling everything, are we really free? A third characteristic of this view says that God has some people who are among the elect. God has chosen some of you for eternal life, and the rest of you are going to H-E double two fit. Salvation is for some, not everybody. God figured it out from all eternity, who is going to go to the good place, and the rest of you, well, you know, there's a basket heading for hell, and you're going there. Now, most people who believe this think that in some way this is a loving thing for God to do, to send some people to heaven and other people to hell, 
And most of them also think it's about our bad free choices. But then you go back to the first or the second one up there about God being omnipotently in control and you wonder, well, how is there really any freedom here? Seems like God is deciding from all eternity our ultimate destiny. That doesn't make sense to me at least. Maybe it does to some of you. Let me look at a fourth characteristic. This God, if you catch him on a good day, and notice I said him because it's almost always a him. If you catch him on a good day, he'll forgive you. You got to cross your fingers and hope that God's graceful because God doesn't seem to forgive everybody. In fact, God, this God won't forgive unless you get down on your knees, fold your hands, and say, pretty please, and then God will relent and say, okay, you're forgiven. But not always, because if you're really bad, if you're really unrighteous, and God knows from all eternity you're going to hell, why forgive you? You're hopeless. Another characteristic of this conventional God. This one sounds really disturbing to a lot of people when I point it out, but most of the major theologians, let me pick on Augustine again, since Jerry and I had a conversation about Augustine earlier. Jerry, I mean, Jerry, Augustine. <laughs> Everybody mixes those two up. <laughs> Augustine had this view of God's love that said that God was only interested in what was most valuable. God's love was for that which was supremely worthwhile. And God is supremely valuable and worthwhile. Therefore, God only loves God's self. Convenient. Like the ultimate narcissist. God is turned into God's self because God's smart enough to know God is the only one who's valuable. Does that sound like the kind of love we find in some of the most well-known biblical passages, like God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life? I don't think so. That sounds like a God who says, I'm the only one worth contemplating, and I will do that everlastingly. That's part of the conventional view of God, at least Augustine's version of it. This, what is this, seventh one, sixth one. The God in this particular view is either the one who's causing everything that's bad in the world or at least allowing it. Now, if you're a person in this congregation who's been around church for a while, you probably know about these debates between the Calvinists and the Arminians. And it's usually about free will and it's usually about whether or not God is causing the bad stuff in the world. And usually what happens is the Calvinist says God is omnipotently in control and therefore every war, every murder, every torture, every rape, every pandemic somehow mysteriously a part of God's plan and it must be good. The Arminian comes along and says no, no, there's free will in the world. God could have stopped all those bad things but God chose to allow them, to permit them. I'm coming to you today from Idaho, and I have a little stream. Well, it's actually a good size stream. It's as big as for me to Pastor Mark that goes behind my house in a little subdivision. And it's about maybe three feet deep at its, at its deepest. Suppose some summer day my daughters are out in the backyard, and let's put them back when they're, I don't know, eight to 12 years old. And suppose they're playing in the water and having a good time, and I'm out in the backyard doing a bunch of lawn work, which is already a myth because I don't like lawn work, but let's pretend like I'm actually doing lawn work for once. And suppose I look up and I see my youngest daughter has gotten so angry with my other daughter, she takes her head, puts it in the water, sits on her, and is trying to drown her. And I look up from pulling weeds, and I say to myself, whoa, if something doesn't change, my kid's going to drown. One of my kids is going to kill my other kids. Now suppose I'm close enough, I could wade out into the water and rescue the one being drowned. But suppose I stand back and I say, you know, 
Who am I to intervene? I'm just going to be a loving father and allow my, free, my kids exert their free will here. I'll just go ahead and let my kids kill each other. Nobody in my subdivision would say, you know, that Tom, what a loving father he is, boy. <laughs> and yet, most Christians I know think that God allows evil that God could stop and that somehow that's a loving thing. That makes no sense to me. But that's part of this conventional view of God. Let me look at another thing. This God is so self-sufficient and so unrelated and so aloof that we don't affect God in one single way. God doesn't need us in any sense possible. God can do whatever God wants to do and get any job done, and whatever we do isn't ultimately significant at all. God has no needs. This God also has a predetermined blueprint. As I mentioned earlier, God from all eternity has decided that I'm going to be standing before you this morning with my hands outstretched like this. And every bad thing that's ever occurred as well. This God, in the conventional view, will occasionally jump in the mix of things, interrupt, and do something great. A miracle, maybe. Normally, the God is sort of hands-off. But every once in a while, at least according to this view, God has to jump in and fix things, intervene, interpose, supernaturally interrupt the normal causal sequence of events. Of course, those of us who hear this often wonder, why doesn't this God do this a whole lot more often? If God can intervene once, why not a lot more often to stop the crap that we have to sometimes endure. This God also, and finally, loves sporadically. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. There's even some biblical support for a God whose love is not, as we looked at earlier, steadfast. Now, I'm a guy who likes the Bible a lot. I'm one of those weirdos who did Bible quizzing as a kid, you know, went to seminary, studied the Bible. I know it pretty well. And I've read the Bible, and I'd like to say that every single part of the Bible points unequivocally to a God who loves everyone all the time. But I'm guessing you have read the Bible too, and you know there's some pretty difficult passages in the Bible. There's some other ones that point to a loving God. And I think the revelation we find in Jesus Christ is of a God who loves everyone all the time. But i got to be honest, there's some portions of the Bible, some stories that portray God in pretty unloving ways. The one that comes to mind at the moment is in the Psalms, in which the people believe that God wants them to bash babies' heads against the rocks. That doesn't qualify as loving in my list. This God, in this view, loves sporadically, or at least maybe loves all the time, but we just don't understand how bashing babies' heads against the rocks is loving. But in God's perspective, it is. Now again, I don't want to say that every single person who has a view different from me embraces this conventional God, but these are ten characteristics of that kind of God. I'm wondering this morning, show of hands, how many people have heard this God described in one way or another? Would you raise your hand? Yeah, I'm guessing this is not new to a lot of you. I want to propose to you a different way to think about God, a way that I think meshes with most of Scripture. I'm not going to claim all of Scripture. I like to say it meshes with the good parts. (laughs) It's also, I think, revealed well in Jesus of Nazareth. It fits our deep, deep moral intuitions. It makes a heck of a lot of sense. It jibes with the sciences, natural, social, medical sciences. Okay, I'm building it up now, right? Let me get to it. This open and relational vision. And you're going to see that I'm going to contrast it with the conventional God. This is a God who moves through time with us. Actually experiences time. The past is past for this God. The future is open for this God. This God is not aloof and out there. 
but actually with us, moving through time, moment by moment. This God is not in the business of controlling. In fact, I like to say, this God always expresses uncontrolling love. Uncontrolling love. Non-coercive, persuasive. And since I'm in a Methodist church this morning, let me use a word that John Wesley liked to use. He liked to say, God woos us. Woo, that's a good love word. You woo your lover. That's not force. That's not control. That's a God who is acting, not on the sidelines, really active and engaged, but in an uncontrolling way. This God, the open and relational God, wants everyone to find salvation in this life and the next. Not selecting some, electing others. Everyone this God is seeking to save at all times and places. No one is irredeemable in this perspective. This God, always forgiving. Always. Let me say that one more time. Always forgiving. Never retaliating. This is not the kind of God who's got a big switch, takes you out in the backyard and cleans up on your backside when you do something wrong. This is a God who loves and forgives every time. No exceptions. This open and relational God does love God's self, but also loves you and me. And you might have thought I would have just put this God only loves creation, but I think it's important to say God loves God's self, in part, because the Apostle Paul says we're supposed to imitate this God. And I think it's healthy to have a healthy self-love. We actually ought to love others and ourselves like God loves others and God's self. That's also a part of this open and relational vision of God. This God, now this is the hard one for a lot of people to swallow. If you can't swallow this one, let me just encourage you to come to our after, uh, what is it, 11 something 1145 discussion. I know this is going to be a big one for some of you to put your head around, but I'm going to make this plain that the open and relational God simply can't stop evil single-handedly. And not only am I going to make the claim, I'm going to make the claim that that's good, good news. Because I get letters every week from people who read my books, especially one called God Can't, and they're from victims and survivors who have been told that God could have stopped what happened to them, but God allowed it. And they're thinking, okay, God hates me then. God's punishing me. It must be all my fault that he did this to me. But if God simply can't prevent evil single-handedly, then you've got a God who's not culpable, morally responsible for failing to prevent evil. And that's good news to lots of people. This open and relational God actually needs our help if love is to win. You see, the traditional God can just up and do anything. The future's already settled, doesn't need us, which means, as I'm going to point out in a second, our lives really aren't very significant. Well, that's putting it mildly. Our lives aren't in any way significant. But the open and relational God says to you and me, I'm calling you to join in the work of love. And if you refuse, not all the good that I want to see happen in the world can happen. I need you and your positive response if love is going to win in the fullest way possible. This God actually needs us in the cooperative, synergistic, work of salvation. This God is not flying by the seat of her pants. There's no absolute blueprint. God hasn't detailed everything out, but God's got some general plans. And those plans are for you and me and all of creation to flourish. The general plan is that you and I live lives of love. The details, yeah, they'll get worked out moment by moment as God calls and you and I freely respond. 
So this isn't a God who's winging it, but it also not a God who's got every single detail already pre-decided, you know, uh, pre, predetermined in advance. Nine. This God isn't up on Mars eating popcorn, twiddling her thumbs, thinking, good luck down there. This God is present with us moment by moment, empowering, inspiring, and not just encouraging, but also feeling with us the joys and sorrows that we go through day by day. I don't know how many people come to me and say, thank God that God feels what I'm going through right now. To have someone who you think can empathize can make a world of difference when you're going through tough times. The God I'm proposing is a supremely empathetic God. And finally, this God's love is relentless. Never stops. Always going. All the time. I think you kind of figured that one out by now. So let me conclude by looking at Ahmad, Margie, and Karen. The test case of pointless pain, well, I think, whoops, excuse me, I think an open and relational God is not responsible for causing the pain that Karen and others have gone through, or even somehow permitting and allowing it as if God could have stopped it, but God chose not to. The test case, I think, in this uh, situation strongly points to the idea that an open and relational God makes a whole lot more sense when it comes to suffering and evil. Take the other test case. What about Margie? The God I believe in is always forgiving, is not a kick-your-butt punishing kind of God. Always, always, always. Yeah, there's some natural negative consequences that come from when we hurt each other, but it's not God kicking us in the butt. God's a forgiving God. And finally, when it comes to Ahmed, I don't think God is timeless or omnipotent. I think we can say that our lives truly matter if there's an open and relational God who is calling upon us, empowering and inspiring us to live lives of love. That God needs our cooperation. Do I know that what I've said is absolutely true? No. I wish I could say that some days. I wish I could say this open and relational vision, that's obviously every person who's got a brain is going to embrace this because it's obviously true. Every last portion of scripture supports it, but I can't. But what I am doing, I'm trying to live every moment of my life as if it is true. And I find that that attempt to live as if there is a God who's loving, open, and relational makes a world of difference in how I live, think, and act. And I propose it to you this morning. Thank you.
Friends, I want to invite you to join us at 11.45 in Fellowship Hall for a time of question and answer with, with Dr. Ord and me. We'll have a, a light lunch that's served by our uh, United Women of Faith. It'll be a great opportunity for you to engage with Tom about your deeper questions after hearing him speak today. Also, I want to encourage you between services to feel free to come forward and talk with Tom, introduce yourself. We have some of his books that are available for sale today as well and uh, opportunities for us to maintain a relationship with him as you saw on the screen with some details on contact information. With that, let's uh, join together in our benediction on the screen. May we say together, we go now to bless the world, to sustain the weary with a word of hope, and to draw neighbors and strangers into the refuge of grace, and to bear the love of Christ in every place, at all times, for all God's people. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.